Five hours before he is destined to take a giant stride into history, Colonel John H. Glenn Jr. squeezes into his spacesuit. His smiling face belies the ten postponements of his flight that have kept him grounded. Many times I, I went on the 11th scheduled date, yeah, but I was up on top and uh, actually ready to go on two previous occasions. This morning, the weather over Cape Canaveral and in the pickup areas is better, and there's an air of optimism as the colonel walks to the gantry elevator, carrying his now familiar portable air conditioner. Glenn prepares to go to the 11th deck as clocks point to 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The skies are beginning to lighten, and a cool north wind rustles across the Cape. And we've done this, as I said, uh, had done this three times before, so we came down to that particular day and uh, we're on the way out. I guess I, uh, I couldn't really believe that we we're going to go that day, but it, it worked out that we did. The Colonel's date with destiny comes 10 months after the Russians claimed an orbital flight by Yuri Gagarin. I think people forget back at that time, this was in the depths of the Cold War. And we were in a uh, contest with the Soviet Union, and, and they had boosters, of course, that were operating well when we, ours were too often blowing up on the launch pad. That was a lot of the impetus driving the early days of the uh, space program. This is the climax of three years of training. This is the moment when the eyes of the world turn to Cape Canaveral. The Russian orbits were in a thick fog of secrecy. The United States stands or falls in the white-hot glare of worldwide publicity. In the capsule atop the Atlas missile, the Colonel will be strapped to a contoured couch. Once in flight, the Mercury will be tilted so that the astronaut will ride backwards. Really plugging in, you're, you slide into this thing, it's not very big. And it's, uh, we used to joke about the, the spacecraft, we said you didn't, climb, you didn't get into it, you actually put it on. It was more like putting on clothes, it was that small. Because the whole thing, if you, if you spread your arms out like that, the uh, uh, you were touching both sides of the, of the spacecraft. The seconds tick off as his rendezvous with space approaches. The hatch cover causes a slight delay when a defective bolt is discovered. Then, millions are moved to silent prayer. And so, uh, I've been through this before, and so the day of the launch, when it actually occurred, I could hardly believe it when they got down to the 18-second automatic count uh, I thought, wait a minute, this is, there's something wrong here, we're not going to cancel. <laughs> Everything is go. The takeoff of the Atlas, blasted off by 360,000 pounds of thrust, carries the Mercury gracefully skyward. Friendship 7, climbing rapidly out of the Earth's atmosphere, exerts a pressure of six times the force of gravity on the astronaut. Loud and clear, he reports back to Mercury Control, reading off his instruments, commenting on his reactions, all as coolly and calmly as if he was commuting on the 827. Well, and that, of course, I was glad to get going. Uh, there's a lot of misconception, I think, still in a lot of people. They, they look at a, a liftoff, and they see all the fire and the smoke and everything is going and they think the astronaut must be going through real torture inside of tremendous pressures and all. And it's quite the opposite. You have to remember that the, the, the rocket booster, the, the engines, just have enough thrust to barely get that whole heavy booster going. And so it's a very gentle liftoff as you come up and as the fuel burns out, then the, the thrust is remaining the same, and so you're going faster after you get, and you get into the, the maximum G forces that you feel on your body are just before you get into orbit when the fuel is down very light and the thrust is still there from the engines. And so you're accelerating, and on the Mercury flight, got up to about uh, almost eight times gravity, about 7.9. But it was in this direction instead of this direction as it would be if you were sitting up in a fighter airplane. Well, it looks very impressive from the outside. The astronaut is not under any big stress inside during that period of time. Now comes the moment when the Mercury is turned so that Glenn will be seated facing backwards. He checks with ground control. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, turn around has started. Capsule turning around, and I could see the booster doing turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. 
People have tried to equate it with floating in a swimming pool or something like that, but it's not that, or being underwater and being balanced. And you don't get the same feeling. When you're in space, you're, uh, you're completely free to float. If I pushed off from the desk here and pushed up and we were in space, I'd just float on up to the ceiling. You can push off there. And once you're up there in our steady state, uh, steady state in the zero G, well, it's very comfortable. Actual pictures of Glenn in the capsule will give scientists the opportunity to study his reactions. One of the unusual things about this, uh, I don't know if people might notice down at the lowest, lower part on my chest, looks like a round mirror, which is exactly what it is. And that mirror uh, is a parabolic, slightly, slightly curved mirror. And the purpose of it was, since the camera was mounted on the instrument panel that was taking pictures of me, this could be used then as a backup on the what the instrument readings were on the instrument panel by having the mirror look back the other direction. And so they could double check, uh, double check all the readings on the instrument panel. He speeds at 17,500 miles an hour, reaching a high point of 160 miles and a low altitude of 99 miles. The problems I had during that first flight were, were uh, the first one was at the end of the first door. We, we had planned to make most of the flight on automatic control. And they had the gyros and they're hooked into the thrusters and so on. You had backups on that then where I could operate that same, all those same functions uh, with the hand controller that we have on display out here. Uh, the automatic system failed. One of the thrusters stuck at the end of the first orbit. And so that was fouling up. It was using too much fuel. And it was going, we were going to have to cut the flight short if it kept doing that. So I cut the automatic systems off and went to manual control on that, which uh, they, uh, and that was one of the things we'd wanted to prove, whether people could do this or not. We were gonna do it on a longer basis, but uh, when this emergency occurred, I just cut them all off, okay, roll, pitch, and yaw, same time, and controlled manually, which I had a lot of confidence we could do, or I could do. Each of the three orbits takes about 90 minutes. Three times the colonel sees the sun rise within a period of four hours and 56 minutes. Three times around the globe for a trip of 81,000 miles before he re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, a shield protecting the astronaut from the intense heat. Going over two of the ground stations, there had been an indication that the, the heat shield was loose. Now ordinarily when you come back in and make a re-entry, and you're falling straight down, you come down to about, when you finally get down to about 10,000 feet and the main chute comes out, is fired, it comes out, and then once you're on the main chute coming down, the whole heat shield uh, is released from uh, metal dogs like a watertight door. Those are, are pulled and the whole heat shield drops down about four feet. If that had been true, if the heat shield had been loose, then during re-entry, uh, the whole thing would probably have burned up. So we left the, the retro packs, which sat right in the middle of the heat shield, and they're strapped onto the spacecraft by three metal straps. And they uh, decided to leave that, those ret the retro pack in place with those metal straps to hold the heat shield uh, instead of releasing the retro pack as would be normal for a, a normal re-entry. It made then for a very a spectacular re-entry from where I was because uh, when we when I was re-entering the atmosphere and all the burning was going on behind me I could see out through the little window over my head uh, these burning chunks of retro pack that were coming back by the uh, by the window and I couldn't be a hundred percent certain whether they were uh, heat shield or whether they were retro pack it was burning up, and, but it was quite impressive from where I was with these uh, chunks coming back by there. It's the destroyer Noah, and she speeds to the capsule to take the vehicle and pilot aboard. Despite a few shaky moments among ground control personnel, Glenn is down, hale and hearty. With support cables attached, a pincer-like crane will lift the Friendship 7 aboard.
end of a saga. The now famous Friendship 7 is safely lashed to the deck of the destroyer and the crew prepares to help Glenn from the capsule. First, they attempt to help the colonel from his complex prison through the upper exit in the mouth. They encounter difficulties, and so it is decided to blow off the escape hatch cover. End of the flight, I was in, in good shape at the end of the flight. I was hot, but uh, it was interesting that I, when I wanted to get out finally, and had made sure that all the sailors on the deck of the NOAA destroyer were not there right up close to the spacecraft if I was going to blow that hatch, and I hit the hatch with my, my knuckle through the, the silver glove. And the, the plunger, when it set off the charge, the, uh, the, the charge in the explosive hatch, uh, it kicked back enough that it uh, split the skin here. And so that was my only, my only uh, wound from the whole flight was a little skin knuckle here that happened getting out at the end of the flight. First glimpse of the conquering hero. Colonel John H. Glenn, he left his footprints among the stars. He has a grin as wide as the path he blazed as he rests briefly before being flown to the carrier Randolph by helicopter. The helicopter takes him to the Randolph for a debriefing and examinations by medical men. The copter no sooner touches down on deck than Glenn gets a preview of the congratulations that are still to come. On every hand there is jubilation, on every side smiles and cheers. He signs over his precious log and instruments to the National Space Administration. From here, he goes to Grand Turk Island for further rest before the deluge. A deluge of honors a proud country waits to bestow on a brave man. It was quite exhilarating because uh, there had been some doubts about different things. We'd had some problems during the flight and had been able to overcome those, and it was, and we'd, we'd set out to uh, uh, show as a country that we could do this. So, uh, so to bring off a successful mission meant a lot, and it meant a lot to me personally.